our sixth of eight uh, presenter series, and then we are going to follow with three wonderful films built, uh, made based on uh, Henry James. So, um, and then next week, as, as Sarah mentioned, uh, Dr. Levine is going to come not to give shots, <laughs> but to talk about the dilemmas of a public health crisis. So, we'll see you then. Um, also, next week, the planning committee for OLLI meets. So, if you have ideas for future events, you can let us know. Let the table know. Let the table know. <laughs> We'll table um, your ideas. <laughs> so you're not surprised to know that there are amazing people in Vermont. Um, and I only accidentally ran into E.O. Wilson. Are people here familiar with him? Oh, look, there's a nod, another nod, 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 nod. That's great. Um, and then because I ran into him, I ran into Kurt. And uh, Kurt is the co-founder of the Vermont Alliance for Half of it. He'll explain that. And he's the co-editor for this amazing book, and that great photograph. Um, and this book makes really complex topics approachable and, and um, overwhelming tasks approachable, too. So it's a great book. And he's brought some. Um, and he brought also his cohort, his colleague, Maddie. Um, Maddie and Kurt collaborated on one of the essays in here. And I'm going to read uh, Maddie's bio. Is that okay, Maddie? Her book bio, which I'll drop the, uh... oh, here it is. Maddie Lindbergh is now 12 years old, who loves nature. She, like E.O. Wilson, loves little things. Maddie lives in Montpelier, Vermont with her family, her mouse Milky Way asteroid, <laughs> and dog Rosie. She attends Main Street Middle School, where she is cutting classes. Matt, <laughs> to be here. But it's science, so it's kind of OK. And she's the granddaughter of Kurt. All right. And I want to just read, Kurt won't like this, <laughs> but I got the mic. <laughs> I want to read what one of his colleagues said about him. He said, the nucleus of the group, which is the Half Alliance and this group that got this book together, the strong, attractive force that pulled us together and continues to hold us together is Kurt Lindbergh. He'll deny it, but Kurt is a force of nature with the ability to cajole, motivate, and inspire those around him. So we're very lucky to have him. Thank you. Let's see. Uh, can people hear me, or should I use this? Use, the use that. OK. How's that? Flick it up. Oh, the green light's on. Okay, then it was. Is it on? Is it, yes. Yeah? Okay. Do you need to it, have it be close? Hold it closer. Hmm. Uh -huh. Let's see if we can do this. Ted, you're a rock and roll singer. Jeez. Uh -huh. <laughs> How about that? All right. Yeah? <laughs> okay. He's kind of soft spoken for a force of nature, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm going to read some things, some things once in a while, so I'm going to need my hands. Um, so, um, who, who knows a little bit about E.O. Wilson? Yeah, um, what do you know about him? Oh, he's a leader in the environmental and thought-provoking ideas about saving Earth. Yeah. He's an insect person first, ants in particular. You know a lot about him. <laughs> Who else knows some things about E.O. Wilson? I think we know the same things that Ann knows. Oh, really? Thank you, Ann. Yeah. Um, well, when um, we were working on this book and I asked Maddie if she would help me about a chapter about E.O. Wilson, um, 
she had an idea of something we ought to include in the book. Right, Maddie? Do you want to talk about that? Hmm? <laughs> hmm? Yeah? I'm talking about the pinfish. Um, I thought that we should put a part about how uh, or what led him on the path to uh, studying like little things and ants. Now, what was it? Um, it was about um, how a pinfish, uh, the dorsal fin spine, uh, hit his eye and lost, he lost most of his sight in that eye. Oh. Right. So he developed very fine sight in his other eye, and that's what in, in why he ended up studying little things. So he was the, like the world's leading expert on ants. And he wrote a book, a textbook on ants, it's about this thick, that is the only scientific text to win a Pulitzer Prize. So he's an not only an incredible scientist, but a wonderful writer. Um, so if, you, if you're interested in learning more about E.O. Wilson, he wrote a memoir called Naturalist, which is just a glorious, glorious book. Um, but one of the main, um, so in, in addition to being the world's leading expert on ants, um, he was one of the first scientists to recognize the importance of biodiversity to life on Earth. And he did a ver some very famous um, experiments that led to what's called the theory of island biogeography. And let me just explain that a bit. So uh, off the Florida Keys, he actually covered um, several small islands and then fumigated the islands and really basically killed all the living creatures on those islands. And then he studied the repopulation of those islands over time. And he, what he discovered was that the islands where there was the fastest return of species and the highest number of species were the larger islands and those islands that were close to shore, you know, so the, to the source of the, uh, of the um, animals that kind of moved, moved back. And that discovery um, is just a fundamental insight into conservation. And we've all heard about the importance of preserving large intact forests right? The importance of having corridors for wildlife to be able to move, you know, from forest block to forest block. Well, his um, island biogeography work is the science behind that, those discoveries. Um, so um, he really was one of the kind of um, creators of the kind of conservation movement because he realized that life on Earth uh, was dependent on these large wild areas that are connected, you know, so wildlife can, can move. Um, and he was also um, one of the earliest um, thinkers to call our attention to what humanity was doing to nature. And, and I'm going to read um, a chapter from, you know, a section from the chapter that Maddie and I wrote um, that's, that's about that. Um, so Wilson attributed his debut as an activist to a question posed to him and six other Harvard University professors in 1980 by the editors of Harvard Magazine. What do you believe will be the most important problem facing the world in the coming decade? Poverty was the most frequent response. Other nominations included the nuclear threat and the welfare state in the United States. Wilson went in another direction. The worst thing that can happen, will happen, is not energy depletion, economic collapse, limited nuclear war, or the conquest by a totalitarian government. 
as, terribly, as terrible as these catastrophes would be for us, they can be repaired within a few generations. The one process ongoing in the 1980s that will take millions of years to correct is the loss of genetic and species diversity by the destruction of natural habitats. This is the folly our descendants are le least likely to forgive us. So he was in 1980 talking about the decline of nature and the loss of, loss of biodiversity. Um, so his, his work um, was really the inspiration behind this book because we wanted to raise awareness of the catastrophe that we humans are causing. Um, and we wanted to um, also pair that with a hopeful story, that there are things we can do to help nature restore um, itself. So that became the, the motivation behind this book and the title, Our Better Nature. Um, so the book is, is written uh, mostly by Vermonters, um, about Vermonters. Um, and the uh, one of, who's been to American Flatbread in Waitsfield? Well, the owner of American Flatbread, his name is George Schenck. Um, he's an avid conservationist, um, and he wrote the foreword um, to the book. So um, wanted to read a little bit from George's foreword. And it really, it really highlights how prescient E.O. Wilson was, right? So going back 1980, he was calling about this crisis. So George writes, nature is in trouble. Almost everywhere biologists have looked, they have found the biosphere in decline. The numbers are staggering. Between 1970 and 2016, populations of mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fish declined by an average 68%. In the last 50 years, North America has lost 3 billion songbirds. 90% of the world's marine fisheries that for millennia have been an important source of nutritious and delicious food for the family, for the human family, haven't been either overfished or fully exploited. And a broad range of insect species has declined by 40%. Forests so essential for wildlife habitat and the regulation of the atmosphere have been and continued to be cut, burned, and fragmented to the detriment of the native species that depend on them. And 98% of the native vegetation in North America's largest biome, the prairie, have been overturned by modern agriculture that has replaced a complex self-regenerative grassland ecosystem with a monoculture cropping dependent on synthetic fertilizers and pesticides. So, you know, that continues this really depressing, depressing story. Um, so in the book, there are a series of essays um, about that, about the connection between climate change and biodiversity loss, about carbon capture in forests, about conservation science in Vermont. And we paired those essays um, with stories about what people are already doing in Vermont to help nature recover and restore. And it turns out that one of the stories is from Montpelier. So anybody know Charlie Hone? Montpelier resident? Well, here's a, here's a picture of Charlie kind of looking out over his yard. And the caption on that, on that story says, this was lawn eight years ago, this whole thing. When I first was first mowing it, it was like, ugh, it's a pain to mow this, it's too wet. And then I was like, well, 
Why am I mowing a wetland? This is absurd. <laughs> And Charlie is a wetland ecologist, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> so he said, so it's the chapter about Charlie says that um, Charlie knew that even small seeps are important for biodiversity and water quality. So he decided to stop mowing. When we bought the land, the spring was this little thing flowing into the ditch on my neighbor's property. Pretty soon, I started planting some native plants down, down here on the side because it was kind of wet. Later one winter, when the ground heaved with all the freezing and thawing, the water found an animal burrow and shifted onto Charlie's land. I know it's not like the water is literally saying, oh, I'm going to visit that thing Charlie built, but it almost feels like the wetland is sucking the hydrology and sucking in the components that belong there. Charlie's soggy lawn has turned into a functioning ecosystem that now helps filter and re retain stormwater and provides a home to new plants and animals. I'll get rid of the invasive plants if I can, and then in the wetland, I'll plant native plants if I can get them," said Charlie, explaining how he takes care of his yard. Other native plants have moved in on their own, followed by insects and amphibians. I'm just trying to heal something in a very small sense with this land, Pos positively influence at least something small. Speaking of his three-year-old daughter, Holly, Charlie said, my other passion now is, to get, is that I get to show Holly all this stuff. I grew up in a concrete wasteland where we didn't have nature in wetlands like this. So here's someone in, in Waitsfield, create, in Waitsfield, in Montpelier, creating a healthy, vibrant little ecosystem, you know, for, for all the other things that live here in Waitsfield. In, I live in Waitsfield, you can tell. <laughs> um, so another little, um, little story is, is about George Shank. If you've been to Flatbread, you know, you can visit his little farm right next to it and you go back in there and he's got all these signs up about what he's trying to accomplish um, in his farm and he's kind of set it up as a little kind of education center for for people so so George Shank is the owner of LaRue farm and founder of American flatbread around the hearth George's goal is to create delicious food but on the farm, his goal is to create habitat for wildlife. I've started to see all the different lives around me as my partners in this journey, said George. And as a partner with them, I have both the responsibility and the opportunity to choose to be constructive to the lives of others or to be hurtful to the lives of others. A case in point is a little brook that runs under a fallen tree and into a restored wetland back behind the garden. George explained the scene, saying, a lot of creating biodiversity is about creating diversity in the habitat, creating the opportunities for life. For decades and decades, if a tree like that fell on this land, it would be removed. And that's not wrong from the farm's point of view, but it is not good from the wildlife's point of view. And so what we're trying to do here is to say, well, where's the balance? What can I do that would be responsible to the agricultural interests of the farm and its food production values, but also responsible to, to wildlife? And sure enough, under the fallen tree was an animal track. Do you see it in the monk, the muck? It was made by the front paw of a raccoon, and the prints of the hind, hind feet were found just a few inches away. Back in the gardens, George has created structures for wildlife to use, like extra tall fence posts and brush piles. The fence, fence posts are constantly used by birds, but just a few hundred yards away in the hay field where the landscape doesn't have the same three-dimensional structure 
there's less bird activity. So those are just I mean, a few examples of what George Schenck is doing on his, his tiny little, little farm. Um, I, I'd, I'd be interested in um, hearing from some of you about what ideas you may have done, you know, on your land or ideas you have for what people can do um, to protect, you know, wildlife and create really nice habitats for them. Anybody? Got some? Yeah. I, I have two acres. Two acres, mm hmm. Out in the middle of nowhere. Mm hmm. And um, I have many sort of small fish gardens. I also have wetland, which was not meant to be, but it's pretty soggy most of the time. Mm hmm. So I'd actually be curious to know what I can plant. I mean, I still like lawn, um, but I don't know what to plant there. I have all these other plants that the birds and the mice like, um, and even the dogs like. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I'd love to know what kind of plants are in the wetland besides turtle head. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah. Um, and there may be. Well, there's a, uh, there's a great book called uh, Nature's Best Hope. It was written by uh, an author and a uh, scientist by the name of Doug Talame. And um, it's, it's, I think I brought it with me here. It's going to come on the library soon, right? I'll look it up. Yeah, yeah it's, it, it probably is in the library. It's at the bookstore locally, as is, is this book. Um, but he, he, with his students, created a, um, a website called Native Plant Finder. So you can plug in your zip code, and it'll bring up the native plants that will do well, you know, where you live, and that will attract insects and butterflies and caterpillars, you know, which are the, the kind of foundation for a local healthy habitat and, and for the birds. Um, and then you can, um, and then certain of those um, plants and shrubs, you know, will be appropriate for wetlands. So what Charlie Hone was doing, he would plant some native species in his, you know, former former lawn, now wetland, and he would also, what else would he do? What would he remove? Invasive. Uh, invasive species, right? So invasive species are those that are not from here, and nothing depends on them. You know, they're generally were brought in here for ornamental purposes because insects didn't eat them, right? And if you've got no insects, you've got no birds, you know, so um, removing invasive species is another important thing to do in um, um, preserving healthy habitat. You know, um, of course the big, invasive species around here is Japanese knotweed, which we see all along the rivers. Um, bishop's weed, right, right. Buckthorn, right. Yeah. As someone who grew up in Waitsfield and reads the Valley Reporter, I know that they did a huge thing of trying to get some of the, that Japanese knotweed taken out, and uh, th I thought that was wonderful. But I still, when I go out 100B, I still see all this Japanese knotweed all over the place. And having grown up on a 340-acre farm, I've seen the destruction of what used to be a really wonderful right. place. And read the article about how ticks would not be here if it were not for the fact that we'd gotten rid of the little little animals that used to eat the ticks, and now they go up on the deer. So, the, right. so I really am glad that you live in Waysville. <laughs> <laughs> what other ideas do people have about taking I'm action? You're a Bisbee, okay. <laughs> I have to mention the fear factor. I live off County Hill Road, and I decided not to mow my lawn. It's not a wetland, but it's a lawn, and they shouldn't be able to mow. My neighbors were 
kind enough or frightened enough or something to say to me, oh, you're going to have more ticks. And you know, it's a dangerous thing not to know your law. It didn't faze me. But I made a sign that said nature's choice, so people will know it's intentional. And one of my neighbors, a younger woman, has her own place, and she stopped home. She works for Nature Conservancy. Uh -huh. She understood the principles. She came home from work one day, and there were a lawn mowing crew right at her driveway, ready to mow. And she said, oh, you must be in the wrong place. And they said, no, your neighbors took up a, 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 a lecture. Uh, and they were all the lawn mowers. And she said, no, no, I, I don't want to be in So there's that fear of what your neighbors might think. You gotta ignore it. Right. Well, I, uh, I grew up in uh, New Jersey, and um, there are people who love their lawns in New Jersey, and, and, and uh, Maddie used to visit me. We lived in an old farmhouse, but it had like an acre of lawn, you know, with big old trees, and it was, it was beautiful. And I thought that was what things were supposed to look like, you know, this, this our aesthetic you know, developed over years. The lawn kind of came from England. And when we moved up to Vermont, um, I was wondering, and my son built us a new house, and we were wondering, well, what should we do? It was a couple acres. And I said to my wife, why don't we just leave, leave it and just put a small lawn right around the house where we kind of walk and see what happens. And my wife said, well, what do you think the neighbors are going to say and I said well it'll maybe I don't know what they'll say but it could be a basis for conversation <laughs> and um, I tell you what I found is is the life that was there instead of the lawn, a lawn the ecologists call lawns deserts nothing lives in a lawn basically our meadow is just full of birds and insects and you know bears go through it you know and and it's alive and i just feel enriched by seeing that and by being part of it so in many ways i think by restoring nature we are kind of restoring ourselves um, so i i feel like by doing a little part for nature nature has given back to me um, many, many fold. Um, so, and when in Waitsfield, I, I'm on the Conservation Commission there, and when I pointed, we pointed out that invasive species are the second leading cause of species loss mm -hmm. after habitat destruction. That really energized the community. So we have 20 volunteers, uh, working on knotweed all over town. We, we got an invasive species fund established. We hired five interns from UVM who worked all summer on kind of knotweed management and, and, and control. And so I was so encouraged by that because there's a growing awareness that you know business as usual is not cutting it for, uh, for nature. Um, so I think one action we can think about is like organizing, <laughs> right, right? And like your story, and providing an example that other people can see, right? And sometimes that takes some courage to do it, right? So, um, yeah. <clears throat> the concept of half earth was new to me. I don't know if it's new to other people. And for me, it helps me think in my, in terms of my front yard. Um, could you kind of go over that concept? Do people know it? No. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Maddie, do you want to try to explain that? Half earth? You want the Mac microphone? No? Okay, I'll do it. So, um, E.O. Wilson decided he, learned, he needed to learn some math. He's a biologist. He needed to learn some math to help with his conservation work. Um, and he worked with mathematicians. And he did some modeling and calculations 
that demonstrated that to preserve 85% of the existing species on Earth and to halt the decline and loss of biodiversity, which now is happening at a rate that's a thousand times greater than the natural rate, um, half the earth has to be set aside for nature. So half the land and half, you know, half the water. Um, and so that, you know, that was the, you know, that was the, what led to the title, you know, half earth. Um, that's led to some international and national conservation organizations uh, calling for that level of conservation. And you may have heard um, the movement 30 by 30 means conserve 30% you know, of the planet by 2030. And that's actively being pursued by the Biden administration and many states. It's been considered by the legislature here. Um, but that doesn't just that doesn't mean having 30 or 50 percent of the land like in these forever conserved areas. It means like in total, we need to provide good habitat for nature. So good habitat can be in your yard can be in a town park, can be in a farm, you know, that is managed and run in a, in a certain way. But collectively, that's kind of the, the, the magnitude of the challenge and what nature, the space that nature needs to restore itself. So in the book, um, we've coined the term, not only half earth, half earth, but half yard, half town, half valley, half farm, to get everybody to think about what can they do on the land that they may be connected with. So. I wanted to bring up something about, I belong to an organization called Population Connection. The, the really big problem is the overpopulation of our Earth mm -hmm. and the fact that there are just too many people. You see babies dying in Africa mm -hmm. and, and all the people and the, and the immigrants coming to this country. What can we do to, to stop that? Yeah. That is why we don't have any biodiversity, one of the big reasons behind all this. Yeah, it is the population certainly, and the the agricultural land that is required to feed to feed so many people. Some people say agriculture is or conventional agriculture is is you know the largest contributor to biodiversity loss. Um, you see what's happening in the Amazon, you know, the conversion of the forest to the soybean fields and cattle grazing territory as an example. Um, but what, are, what, are, what other ideas do people have for things that can be done kind of locally here to protect biodiversity? Yeah, in the back there. Well, I really believe that what we do locally by strengthening our community and it will help to other communities, the one strong community, Locally, I, I'm really excited by the um, mycorrhizal remediation of, um, wet, of uh, riparian areas. So Lake Champlain is polluted. We do have a lot of pollution in the state. Fungi are incredible. So we can basically end up composting the fungi that take toxins out of soil. Doing something that otherwise humanity has not been able to do before intentionally. Um, so that's one thing I think of. Uh, and then, of course, transportation is a big thing and home heating efficiency. Mm -hmm. Right. I think you're, that, that points out that kind of climate change and biodiversity loss are like inextricably linked. Mm -hmm. Climate change is causing biodiversity loss. Healthy 
um, or habitats that are failing contribute to climate change. Healthy habitats and forests help mitigate kind of climate change. So and it's one reason I think Wilson was such an advocate for attention to nature is that there's, a, there's awareness, you could say awareness of climate change is up here. Biodiversity is down here, you know, and it needs to be up here and considered as, you know, the two, two most significant issues that, you know, humanity and this planet, you know, are, are facing. Um, so, yes, sir. <laughs> well, I just wanted to make a comment. I, I try to tell people, coal miners used to have a canary down in their mind. So they knew when the air in there was getting hot. If they ignored that, there could be an explosion, there could be fire, there could be just enough of a sad atmosphere in there that they would die from basically lack of oxygen. The death of the various species that we're seeing, the loss of species around this world, tells us that's our canary. Our canary is coughing. Our canary is choking. And we just keep on digging. We haven't done you know, you talk about the, the awareness is not there. If we don't, the one species that we should care about, that we see all the time, or we used to, that we need is the bee, the honeybee, mm -hmm. the, the, the various species of bees are disappearing. And people keep sounding the alarm, and we keep digging, we keep mining away, and we keep going up. I go into population connection too, and, and, and the Earth has exceeded its carrying capacity. Mm -hmm. It has, and we need to admit that. We need to make the the politicians acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. They're not. Instead, they want to pit us against each other. Right. Yeah. They don't right. want to face up. They don't want to face up to anything. If, if Greta Thunberg has, hasn't been, been able to make any kind of uh, an impact, how are we going to make it? Mm -hmm. I, I'm asking. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess my um, just reflections on that is, yeah, I'm not an international figure. I'm not a billionaire. Um, I'm a resident in a small state, and it can feel hopeless in the face of these these challenges. Um, but I become more helpful, hopeful by following the example of what people are already doing and then starting to do more myself. You know, so this book was an example of that, working on my conservation commission in town, you know, um, looking at what I can do in my yard. I've become more hopeful um, and I'm seeing other people join in this. So I think the more of us that can start taking action. And action can be of many forms. You know, it can be as basic as voting and encouraging, you know, support for really strong counter conservation kind of measures. Um, and it could be as simple as taking out some non-native species in your yard, you know, or planting good stuff, you know, for the bees. Um, so, because I think we need, we must, we must remain hopeful. We have to, and I feel more hopeful now because of engaging in this work. What? Engaging in this work, okay. and and finding others that are, and building relationships with them, and um, yes, sir. Uh, I get. Discouraged by the fact that our leadership essentially continues this election. How many times have you heard this kind of thing talked about in all this analysis and, um, and fighting the, the desire for growth? And, and uh, so I think I think we need the local people to give an example, but we do have to communicate this message to our leaders, and I just don't see. 
Well, so let's do more of it ourselves. <laughs> you know, I, um, what, are the, um, what are the environmental groups that you think are, are really critical on this issue? Uh, well, um, I think in Vermont, um, the Nature Conservancy is a leader on biodiversity across the globe. Um, the, in um, the Northeast Wilderness Trust, based here in Montpelier, is seeking to preserve old grow, you know, pre preserve forest land forever. So that's the ultimate step that can be taken to restore nature. The Vermont Natural Resources Council um, does really good policy work. The Vermont Land Trust, Shelburne Farms. North Branch Nature Center. Um, there's the Vermont Center for Eco Studies. Um, and those organizations now are coming together to create um, what we're, I might be calling a Vermont Biodiversity Coalition. Um, to do more together, to uh, educate the public more, um, to figure out what's needed um, and can be done in Vermont. Um, so it's just another example of another action that people and organizations can um, can take. I wanted to, I wanted to ask Maddie, if you don't mind, Maddie, Maddie? whether um, there's this kind of conversation happening at your school, mm -hmm. and whether any of your uh, friends and classmates have talked about how they talk to room full of grandparents. Um, at my school, there's a class about sustainability that everyone rotates through throughout the year that kind of focuses on like, um, kind of like food insecurities and also like biodiversity and stuff. And yeah, that's and there are other like groups. Like there's a group in my school called MSMS Sustain Leadership, um, and they they work on like um, helping people who need help and other like sustainability issues. Mm -hmm. Do you, do your do your friends talk about nature much? Are they worried about it or? Um, they don't really talk about it, but if they do, then they usually seem to know a lot of stuff when they do talk about it. Mm -hmm. And what are you planning on doing in your yard? Uh, we mostly just let it grow out most of the time, but I'll probably just remove, remove like non-native plants. Yeah. Yeah, Maddie lives on Maddie lives on Liberty Street, so her they're planning to plant more natives. And one big thing we people can do with lawns is just reduce the size of the lawn and replace it with natives. So that's what um, Maddie and her mom and dad are going to be working on here in Montpelier. So, so yes, sir. So, uh, you have, kind of have to be a shepherd of your your land. And uh, we had, we still have a woodlot, but we had a woodlot that after there was cutting done, uh, we would spread uh, native millet for the, for the partridge, because the partridge really like that. And I had some friends that were hunting guys, and they would bring their elderly <laughs> hunters to my land to walk around the, <laughs> the easy, uh, uh, the easy pass and have a good, good chance of getting a partridge. So uh, uh, piles of brush, you, you know, so for rabbits and who knows what crawls around. Right. But also being aware, like walking up to Parkapalooza you know, and seeing that they're letting the uh, uh, milkweed grow on the side hill for the, for the uh, modern butterflies. So, to point that out to Maddie the next time, or to Will, you know, whoever. Mm -hmm. But be a shepherd and be an educator. Right, right. 
I was surprised to learn, I think it was from reading Wilson's book about Half Earth, is that um, forests, um, managed forests where some standing dead trees are left yeah. and where woody debris is allowed to remain on the ground have 50% more biodiversity mm -hmm. than the forest that is kind of cleaned. Um, you know, the, the European kind of park look for a forest um, has 50% less biodiversity. So a lot's going on in that dead stuff. <laughs> There's a lot of life right <laughs> there. So that's a, that's a great point. Yeah, Ann? Um, I'm thinking of how to get people working individually towards these wonderful goals. And I'm thinking about a little subterfuge. Um, I have two sons who are in conservation commissions, one in Connecticut and one in Massachusetts. And instead of saying to somebody, it will be better for biodiversity if you plant more trees, they say, well, your view of the lake would be enhanced by having it framed by trees. <laughs> that kind of thing. And they want to be in control. But if their control includes doing the right thing, it's even better. Or a row of shrubbery that may be wonderful for birds and biodiversity, say, the colors will turn beautiful in the fall. So you have to tell people what they want. And they still think they're out of control, but maybe they're doing more than them. Right. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, here, yeah. I have um, 20 or 25 acres of hay field mm -hmm. on my property, and I have an agreement with my neighbors to mow the hay and fertilize as they need. Uh, in the old days, when the farmer up the road had an extended family that worked on the haying and the old guys would come with their sides and cut everything right up to the stone walls. And now, of course, with a tractor, uh, he's not interested in coming close to the stone walls. And at first I thought, you know, how messy. And now I, I appreciate you know, that here there are these little strips, little natural strips mm -hmm. uh, for the birds, and we do avoid the bobolink nesting mm -hmm. season in part of the hay field. But I'm wondering if there's anything else I can do as a hay field owner. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> But I'm sure, I'm sure you could track down a little research that would have some suggestions. But I, I think, you know, ha having native spaces like around it is 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 a really good one. Um, so there's someone over there has had her hand up a long time, I think. I, I'm, I'm curious. We had um, Sean Beckett, who I think you know. I do. Last week, and he mentioned in passing that uh, you were and uh, that he. Yeah, uh, by the way, Sean took most of the photographs in the book. I mean, he's an incredible naturalist and photographer. Um, Can you repeat the question? We can't hear. Oh, she, she was asking um, what what the organization I'm involved with is called the Vermont Alliance for Half Earth. And Sean, I guess, mentioned when he was here last week that the North Branch Nature Center and our Vermont Alliance were doing some things together. Um, we've done several things. One is we have organized uh, what, are, what are called um, bio blitzes with schools in the area. And you, you probably, folks in Montpelier know about bio blitzes, you know. Um, so we organized, uh, during the pandemic, the, uh, it was called the Spring Backyard Bio Blitz, kind of across Vermont. Um, and with North Branch Nature Center created a Educators Institute for Biodiversity, which is for teachers. So every summer, um, teachers spend a week at North Branch learning about biodiversity and how they can integrate it into their curriculum at schools. Um, 
And I guess in addition to this book, uh, North Branch Nature Center is one of the organizations um, that is having these conversations, is joining the conversations about creating a biodiversity coalition for, for Vermont. So you're very lucky to have North Branch Nature Center here. <laughs> it is a treasure. <laughs> right. So. Could you say something about your book? For sale. Well, I and the, and the book group that you heard about in Burlington. Yeah, we did a um, an event similar to this a couple weeks ago in, at the Richmond Public Library, and of course you never know how many people are going to come to these events. But there was a whole contingent there from Burlington, and they had formed a book group, you know, and they were all reading our Better Nature mm -hmm. together, and so they all traveled to Richmond. <laughs> to, uh, for that event. So um, the Richmond Library also has um, obtained, I think, 10 or 13 copies of this book that they're willing to lend out to anybody who would be interested in sponsoring a book group. So if that's of interest to anybody here, um, you know, those arrangements could be made. Um, Maddie and I brought some copies of the book. Um, it 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 sells for I think twenty eight ninety nine. If anyone's interested in in a copy today, um, uh, we'd be happy to make that available to you for twenty dollars. And if you don't have resources um, to pay for a book, we have some free copies that we could give to you um, today. Um, so. Um, I have another question. I mean, my brother owns the, the 340 acres. It's down to less because he's sold off lots and things and everything. But the sugar, the maple sugar orchard, he's clean to get out now with these big tubes and everything. And he, it's all in the land use program, as you would imagine, uh, to avoid paying taxes on it. But he wants to leave it to his children. And I keep mentioning the land trust and all these different things. And do the foresters that are in business today, do they know about all this? Because I don't think of them leaving trees down. They're going to want to cut that and sell it for lumber. Yeah, I think there are um, quite a few foresters who I know who are aware of progressive forest management practices for nature. But not the one he uses all the time. That could be, that, that could be, that could be, but there are foresters who know what to do. Um, there are programs uh, specifically aimed at um, improving habitat in um, sugaring forests. Um, Audubon has a program. But it's um, a money thing. You know, if you grew up here, you, you're making money off, off that land. And that's something that people who move here from New Jersey, I went to college at Rutgers, but anyhow, you, know, you know, you don't understand that nativism that thinks of the forest as being something they're going to get money out of. My grandfather was a lumberman. He had a lumber yard in my, uh, old Walter Moriarty mm -hmm. in, in Waitsfield. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to take up time, but I just think I have a different attitude than maybe a lot of people that have moved here from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Could be, could be. Um, so I think we're almost um, at the hour here. I thought maybe I'd just read a couple more things from the book and, and, uh, and kind of wrap things up for today. Um, so there's a, um, a chapter, a chapter in this book that's called, um, it's called Rewilding. And it's written by Tom Butler, who's a resident of Huntington, and he's been involved in um, um, creating the Northeast Wilderness Trust. He's been involved in the massive efforts in South America to preserve, conserve millions of acres of former ranch lands, which have now been knitted together uh, in national parks, and Tom was involved in that. And 
he basically says, um, well, I'm going to read you what he says. Um, with each breath, with every heartbeat, we live by grace. But while we live, we organize our lives by stories. We understand our place in the world by the tales we tell ourselves. For as long as our species has employed figurative language some 70,000 years ago, we have been talking and listening. Listening and talking to transmit the wisdom, the humor, the codes of right and wrong conduct that collectively form human culture. Later on in his chapter, what new story is big enough to help turn the tragedy of humanity and the diversity of life away from ecological Armageddon? What story is inclusive and attractive enough to inspire millions or even billions of people to put themselves in it? I vote for this one, the story of rewilding of resurgent wildness enveloping the earth, of expanding beauty and diversity, of wilderness recovery writ large, of people from all backgrounds in any corner of the globe lending their energies towards helping nature heal at all scales to the benefit of all life. Could this be the dream that's big enough to capture the hearts and minds of millions that is both timeless and urgent enough to prompt bold action? Could it be the story generous enough to carry our love for specific places into the future in the form of interconnected ribbons of protected habitat wrapping the planet in wild beauty? Maybe, just maybe it is. So. Thank you for coming today and, and so uh, talking with Maddie and me. Thank you, Maddie, for just keeping us cool. Yeah. <laughs>